Okay, uh, so I'm going to try to be really fast so we can have time for discussion. I want to make two main points. The first is a scientific point that many of these predictions are going to be better if they're multimodal, if they take into consideration uh, different types of data from very different sources. Uh, and the second is the ethical uh, issues that I want to uh, focus on, many of which Martha already mentioned, and so I'll be able to go a little more quickly. Uh, so uh, I think we ought to emphasize on what is neural prediction going to be used for. And there are a number of different issues raised. Uh, I want to focus on two of them, early interventions uh, and sentencing. Uh, first, early interventions. Uh, you, you won't be able to see this, but uh, it's a new study by Avshalom Kaspi and Timmy Moffat. Uh, and what they did is they uh, used the Dunedin data from New Zealand, uh, and they tried to predict not just one uh, particular feature, but a number of different features that will cost the government a lot, smoking, uh, crime, uh, unemployment, a lot of different features get done. And the test, the question is, can you predict uh, whether people are going to fall into three or more of those categories? And what did they use for that? Well, they didn't use a single measure. They used multiple measures again. They used what they call a, a brain health. Uh, and brain health is a composite of seven different items. Uh, what's cool about this study is from brain health measured at the age of three, they could predict cost to society in your 30s. Uh, and, and so uh, with uh, an area under the curve about 0.8, what was it, 0.79 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so pretty good prediction. Uh, what they want to argue here is that it's not like we should be testing these people at age three and throwing them into jail. Of course not. Uh, we should be uh, trying to in encourage early interventions of various sorts. And so the question that this raises is should the law require or provide different types of early interventions to stop these outcomes that are dangerous and harmful to them as well as to society? And the answer obviously is going to depend on um, whether we can have an effective intervention. It doesn't do much good to tell parents, like, your kid's going to be a problem uh, if you can't do anything about it. And so we want to know whether the interventions that we're uh, instituting are going to be helpful or, or not. Uh, the error rates when screening the population, uh, if for these behaviors that are a small percentage of the population, uh, you could have a small error rate can turn into a lot of false positives. Uh, and when the false positives are going to be harmful, uh, then that's a problem, such as when they introduce stigma. Uh, the hope is that the interventions might be things that are not very painful, not very costly to the individuals. Uh, and so then if you have a few false positives and you're giving a little extra training, a little extra help uh, to kids uh, that don't really need it, then there's not much problem for them. The problem is going to be the cost to society, right? These training programs are going to cost a lot. Uh, and so there are a number of different ethical issues that get raised uh, by the idea of using these brain measures to predict 30 years later uh, how much um, burden on society uh, these particular individuals are going to be. Uh, so it's going to be quick. I'm moving through this very quickly, just raising a lot of issues. So I move straight to sentencing, uh, another use of uh, neuroprediction uh, in the legal setting. Uh, one obvious case is the death penalty. Uh, in Gregg versus Georgia, uh, 1976, the death penalty was uh, revived. And there, uh, uh, the law that was being considered was uh, the Georgia law said the jury needed to find evidence of one of aggregating, fa aggravating factors. And the defendant created a grave risk of death to others was one of the aggravating factors. So if you could predict that this individual uh, was a grave risk of death to others, then that was the difference between a death penalty uh, and life without parole, uh, or in some states, just plain life. Uh, and that type of rule uh, was then spread through a lot of other states, not just Georgia. Okay, But you might say death is different. Death is not like other penalties. Maybe we ought to. Uh, maybe the legal system is retributivist. There are a lot of legal scholars who think that, that the legal system is retributivist. But if you look actually at the federal sentencing guidelines, for example, they say 
that in determining the sentence, you need to consider the seriousness of the offense, that's the retributivist part, but B, also, uh, whether it affords adequate deterrence to other people and whether it protects the public from this individual. Those are both predictum, predictive uh, things. You've got to know, you know what's going to happen if you impose this sentence. Okay? The model penal code, uh, I think, gives a more accurate picture of my understanding of how the legal system works. Uh, they said the retributivist factor, what the person did, sets an upper limit to how much punish you can do and a lower limit, right? You don't want to give uh, 10 years in jail for speeding and you don't want to give a $10 fine for rape. Uh, there are going to be upper and lower limits. But within those limits, uh, then uh, utilitarian or consequentialist considerations often uh, make a big difference uh, and that's where prediction comes in. So how do we do it? Uh, Martha already mentioned using AI. Well, before they got rid of bail in California, this was how they did it. That you went to court, uh, you were, uh, AI system looked at your data and determined whether you were gonna spend the next year in jail awaiting trial or whether you were going to uh, go home, uh, post bond and then go home uh, and come back later, which made a big difference to keeping your job and your family and so on big difference on people's lives being done by machines, not by judges in this case. Uh, now, a lot of people objected to that. Why? Uh, and Martha already mentioned this. I want to emphasize it, though. Um, uh, anybody know where this quotation comes from? Come on. Monty Python, Life of Brian? Sorry. You're all individuals. And then this one guy goes, I'm not. Uh, uh, and so uh, the objections. Um, that people give are, first of all, that statistical evidence uses subjective classifications to get the apparatus going, as Martha explained. You have to pick the classes that you're going to use in your statistical engine, uh, and it's about groups instead of individuals. Can we avoid subjective classifications? Yeah, we can't avoid it, but we can have reasons based on prior evidence uh, for using certain classifications rather than others. We can have prior assumptions about uh, which classifications are going to be most useful and then test them to see whether they are. But now I want to emphasize whether the evidence is individualized. Uh, so let's think about lotteries. Suppose I buy a lottery ticket, you know. Uh, am I justified in believing that this ticket is going to lose? Sure. 280 million to one it's going to lose, right? Uh, but notice that uh, if I see on the screen that, it, that this was the number that came up, then all of a sudden I'm justified in believing it won. But wait a minute, of course it might have been reported inaccurately. Yeah. And so now what are you going to do? Uh, you can say, most people would say, am I justified in believing that this ticket will lose? Yes. But do I know it's going to lose? No. When do I know it? I know it when I see the number reported. But wait a minute, that's less reliable than the probability. So what's going on here? It seems like in order to have knowledge, you need to have some kind of causal connection to the thing. You saw the number. The number was reported by this, right? So if we say that in order to hold someone in jail for extra time, we need to know that they're dangerous, then I think that's part of why uh, we think that statistics can't be enough. We need more than that. The nice thing about brain scans, and this is where I disagree with Martha, that I think brain scans do raise new ethical issues because they have an advantage over normal statistical engines. You do have individualized data about this particular person you just took a scan of. And so you are looking at that individual uh, when you do the scan. Now, of course, you still have to fit it into categories, but at least you have causal contact as you do in the lottery case. Uh, so it's not that they have disadvantages and raise new ethical problems. They actually have ethical benefits, I think, over the st other statistical engines. Uh, so uh, Kent already mentioned this. We're going to show how neural prediction works. I want to add one more study that Kent uh, also did but that I love because what he did, uh, and Ayal Aharoni also uh, first author did. Oh, no, Vaughn was the first author. Uh, and so... Um, what they did was they combined fMRI 
with EEG and actually two signals, uh, uh, two ERP signals. And what they did was using um, sophisticated statistical techniques, they were able to g achieve a, an accuracy predicting rearrest of 83.33%. Now, I find that very impressive. Uh, but one thing that made it work was that he was combining these different modalities. A lot like Caspian and, and Moffitt did in the first study, you combine the different mod modalities, you can get a lot of advantages out of it. There's still going to be objections. Uh, and I'm going to go through these very quickly so that you can raise objections of your own. One thing is you got to extend it to new groups. You know, if you, t if you test it on one ethnic group and then you extend it to another, uh, uh, without testing the other group, there's a problem. So you need enough data. So what's the solution to that? You need to gather more data. I mean, if you don't have enough data, you got to gather more data. That's kind of obvious. Uh, but also, we should limit testimony in trials using neuroprediction until we have enough data. Now, what's enough? That's going to be a dispute. But, uh, but that's the best solution you can get. The other problem is when you use these sophisticated, sophisticated uh, pattern classifiers, they hide the basis for the prediction. They're often uninterpretable. You don't know exactly how they're yielding the prediction. And that is a problem. If the prosecution is using these, the defense cannot defend themselves. So what's the solution to that? The solution might be, well, let the defense introduce them if they want, and the prosecution can't do it unless the defense does. Uh, it, then you have, you have a strategic decision if you're a defense lawyer uh, but you've overcome the problem of uh, having the prosecution base their argument on something that the defense has no way uh, to re respond to. Pattern classifiers can come up, cover up unintentional bias. Absolutely, but I love Martha's slide where it was, you know, it showed what the bias rates were for Compass. If you know what the bias rates are and you can measure it, then you can correct for it. You can say, well, wait a second, when we're dealing with this kind of person, we got to correct for it. You can't do that with judges. You have no idea what's going on in their heads. Um, and, so, uh, and so there might be an advantage there. Uh, and finally, of course, legal officials might put too much trust in neurosciences, in neuroscience. Uh, I think our studies have suggested that this is not really as bad as many people think it is. Uh, neuroscientists always like to think that everybody agrees to them and bows down to them, but in fact, a lot of people kind of go, ah, you know. Uh, and so uh, it's not clear that they do, uh, but even if they do, the solution seems to be solved by rigorous cross-examination uh, by experts. Studies have shown that when neural lie detection is cross-examined, the effect goes away. Uh, and so I think there are objections, of course. I look forward to talking about them more. But I wanted to throw out at least some ideas about uh, some ways to reply to some of them. Thanks.